Raphael Patai. So he is Jewish, and he translated the Pesikta Rabati in reference to the Messiah, which we'll look at in a minute, but I want to know if he came to follow Jesus. I don't think they'll say it here in Wikipedia. But at least we confirm these are two Jewish scholars. They're not, let's say, Gentiles. They're ethnic Jews. Ethnic Jews, right? So ethnically, they're Jewish. And these are the scholars that translated Pasikta Rabati in order to show the affinity, similarities between rabbinic Judaism's concept of the pre-existence of Messiah with the Christian understanding of the Lord Jesus as a pre-existent Messiah who then became flesh. Everyone with me? May I speak clearly and accurately by your power, Holy Spirit. May I be your mouth, mouthpiece. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, do me a favor, because I don't want to belabor the point. Someone find out if Raphael Patai did end up believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone verify, and may the Lord increase our numbers for his glory. So these are two Jewish scholars that I'm citing. I'm not citing Gentiles, right? And in the case of Rifka Ulmer, she's not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, at least last time I checked. And I'm not fully certain whether Raphael Patai did become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Now, are we ready? Psalm 22 to, to look into it. Are we ready? Are we ready for me? I'm going to read both translations. You ready? If you're ready, that means you're going to stay attentive. So here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn that Psalm 22 is applied to the Messiah by rabbinic Jews. That's the first fact. Second fact you're going to learn. You're going to learn that these Jews affirm the pre-existence of Messiah, that Messiah was already there from creation under the throne of God, having intimate fellowship and communion with God, who would then appear in latter days. If I didn't tell you this was a Jewish source, you would think these are Christians. So two facts. The rabbis acknowledge Psalm 22 is about Messiah. And second fact, the rabbis acknowledge that Messiah has already been existing from the time of creation, and he's with God by his throne, and he will appear in the latter days. These are the two facts we're going to establish from these sources. All right, you ready? Let's begin. I'm going to read, so I'm not going to copy and paste because it's too long. I may copy and paste a few paragraphs here or there, but it's too long for me to post all of it. So bear with me. Here it goes. Pasikta Rabati. Hoshaya said, in the future, Jerusalem will be a lantern for the nations of the world, and they will walk in her light. Now watch here. This one I'm going to post. You ready? This is from the Pasikta Rabati. In thy light do we see light, Psalm 3610. Now watch how they interpret this. In thy light do we see light. Now, guys, get ready to be blown away. In thy light do we see light. This is the light of the Messiah, as it is written, and God saw the light, that it was good, Genesis 1-4. This teaches us that the Holy One, blessed be he, saw the generation of the Messiah and its deeds prior to the creation of the world, and he hid the light for the Messiah and his generation under his throne of glory. I, that should blow you away right there. Right there, that should blow you away. Do you understand what you just read? The Pasikta Rabati says, Genesis 1-4, where it says God saw the light and was good. That's the light of the Messiah. And then it says, Psalm 36, 10, in your light we see light. That's the light of Messiah. But here's why that's mind-blowing. Psalm 36, 10 is talking about the light of God, the light of Yahuwah. But the rabbis say, that light in Psalm 36.10 is Messiah. And the light that God saw was very good. 
That's Messiah. Let me show you that. Here again, what did they quote? Psalm 3610. Well, here's that Psalm. You ready? Here's that Psalm. Psalm 3610. Who's it about? Here you go. Psalm 3610. Okay. Here it is. In your English, it'll be Psalm 36.9. In the Jewish Bible, sometimes the versification is different. So your 36.9 will be there 36.10. Now watch here. Who is the psalmist referring to? Here it is, Psalm 36, 7 to 9. You ready? Here you go. A rabbinic Jewish source, Psalm 36, 7 to 9. Lepant, everyone else. See whose light the psalmist is referring to. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. It's about God. But wait, let's go to the Pasik Tarabati. In thy light do we see light. This is the light of the Messiah. The rabbis, whether knowingly or un unknowingly, just identified Messiah as God, as Yahweh. Because Psalm 36.10, which is Psalm 36.9 in your translation, that light is the light of God, not of a creature. And they told you, John Genesis 1.4, when God saw the light and said it's good, that's the light of Messiah. Is it sinking in before I move on? See, I'm going to go very slow. I may do two parts. Okay, God bless you, Andrew. May the Lord Jesus empower me with the health and holiness and purity and love and devotion to my God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and never stop until he summons me. You understand this is mind-blowing, guys? Are you paying attention? Marcy and everyone, you understand? Rabbis are saying, Psalm 36.9, the light of Yahweh is Messiah's light. And in Genesis 1, 3 to 4, where God says, let there be light, and he saw the light was good, that is the Messiah's light, thereby identifying Messiah as God, begotten of God. You see how easy the true God has made it? The true God is the God of the Bible, Old and New Testaments. The true God is the Father, his Son, and the Holy Spirit. And his Son, the Lord Jesus, is God in the flesh, flesh of the virgin. You see how easy that true God has made it to destroy, demolish blasphemies, blasphemers, and lies and show that we have the truth. And the truth is that our God is Shayun. Now watch here the conversation. Now watch this one. Pasipta Rabati. Watch here. Okay. Satan said before the Holy One, blessed be, master of the world, the light which is hidden under your throne of glory. For whom is it destined? Watch. So he's asking, saying, say, what is this light? It's under your throne of glory. Who's the destined? For him who will turn you back and disgrace you and shame your face. He said to him, master of the world, show him to me. He said, come and see him. When Satan saw the Messiah, he trembled and fell upon his face and said, surely this is the Messiah who in the future will cast me and all the princes of the nations of the world into Gehenna. If I didn't tell you this was a rabbinic Jewish source, you'd think this is a Christian source. Okay? Right? In that hour, the nations will become awestruck and set before master of the world. Who is he and to whose hand we shall fall? What is his name and what is his nature? Now I'm reading the rest of it. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to them, His name is Ephraim, my true Messiah. He will raise his stature and the stature of his generation and will light up the eyes of Israel and will save his people and no nation and language shall be able to stand up against him. All his enemies and adversaries will be affrighted and will flee from him and even the rivers will cease to flow into the sea. Now this paragraph I'm going to quote. Now, here you have the Messiah 
and God speaking. Here is a conversation between God and the Messiah in Messiah's pre-existence. Now watch. The words when he created the Messiah in brackets. Raphael, Patai added that in brackets. But now let's read. When he created the Messiah, the Holy One, blessed be he, began to tell him. So notice, God and Messiah are having a conversation from the start of creation. Meaning Messiah is already there. He's alive and consciously existing with God under his throne. So now God is going to speak to the Messiah. What does he say to him? He says to the Messiah the conditions of his future mission. And said to him, those who are hidden with you, your generation, their sins will in the future force you into an iron yoke. Say what? A rabbinic Jewish source is saying the sins of the people that Messiah will save will become an iron yoke on his neck, bending him over. And they will render you like unto a calf whose eyes have grown dim. And they will choke your spirit with the yoke. And because of their sins, your tongue will cleave. This is Psalm 22, by the way. To the roof of your mouth. Do you accept this? So God is telling Messiah, will you accept being punished and crushed for the sins of the generation you come to save? So he's giving Messiah a choice. Do you accept this? Let me open the door for the cat. Okay. Do you accept this? Now watch what Messiah is going to say. I'm going to read two versions of this. One by Raphael Patai and the other one by Rivka Ulmer. The Messiah said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the world. Will that suffering last many years? Wait, so he's already talking to him. He's talking to him before he comes into the world and does what God destined him to do. Because he's already there. From creation under the throne, and God is telling him, Look, this is your mission. Do you accept it? So now he's asking, How long will my suffering be? The Holy One, blessed be, he said to him, By your life and the life of my head. So God is swearing by himself and Messiah, showing the equality in dignity for God to swear by the life of Messiah and his head. That shows equality of dignity. By your life and the life of my head, it is a septenary of it that I decreed upon you, meaning seven, seven years. But if your soul is troubled, I shall banish them as from this moment. Meaning, look, if you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. I'll just wipe them out. Don't worry about it. I'll punish them for their sin. Now watch here. What does Messiah say? Okay, what does he say? And it's quoting Psalm 22, by the way. I'll give you two versions. I'm going to have to do a part two on this, brethren. I'm going to have to do a part two, obviously, because I just want to go through the rabbinic Jewish interpretation of this text, Psalm 22. So what is his response? With gladness in my soul and with joy in my heart, <clears throat> I accept it, so that not a single one of Israel should perish. And not only those who will be alive should be saved in my days when I show up, but even the dead who have died from the days of Adam, the first man until now. Wow. A rabbinic Jewish source acknowledges Jehovah's light is Messiah's light. And Messiah has been there from creation under the throne of Jehovah. And Jehovah and him are conversing. And Jehovah's asking him, will you take the punishment of the sins of the people? And suffer and die to save them. He goes with gladness. And not only will I suffer for the people in my generation when I show up. But I will take the punishment for the sins of all the people from the time of Adam. I will also take the punishment of the stillborn. Babies who died in the womb. That they should be saved in my days. And not only the stillborn. But even those to whose creation you gave thought, but who were not created, this is what I want. This is what I accept. Pasikta Rabati, Raphael Patai's translation in the Messiah text, the book I have with me now, 
pages 161 A and B. It sounds so Christian that if I didn't tell you it's a rabbinic Jewish source, you would think I'm quoting a Christian scholar. Look what else he cites. Let's continue. They said in the septenary in which the son of David comes, they will bring iron beams and put them upon his neck until his body bends and he cries and weeps and his voice rise up into the heights and he says before him master of the world how much can my strength suffer how much my spirit how much my soul how much my limbs am i not but flesh and blood that answers your question the messiah ephraim of this rabbinic source is the son of david did you get your answer friend archangel media who is the Messiah named Ephraim? The son of David. Because this son of David, who's Ephraim, he's the one who's going to carry this iron yoke in fulfillment of Psalm, Psalm 22. Taken from Pasikta Rabati. Do you get it now, sir? Well, I have heard. That's what you get for hearing. Don't assume. Sucks being you, mister. Can you see it? So what's the response? Watch the response, guys. And then I'm going to give you Rifka Ulmer's translation. Rifka Ulmer's translation. It's all in those articles. Okay. And that hour, the Holy One, blessed be he, says to him, Ephraim. What? Ephraim? I thought he's son of David. My true Messiah. You have already accepted the suffering from the six days of creation. Okay. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to get this, brethren. You see what God is telling him? Ephraim, my true Messiah, son of David. Don't you remember during the six days of creation, you already agreed that you would accept the suffering? So wait, you're telling me the rabbis affirm Messiah was already alive? He was present when God created in six days? Yeah, because he's the light of God that was there under the throne when God said, let there be light and the light was good. You see it? Are you looking at the quote, guys? God is reminding Messiah, Ephraim, my true Messiah, you who became flesh and blood and son of David. Don't you remember during the six days when you were there and I asked you, you accepted? These citations annihilate Islam, Unitarianism, and modern rabbinic <clears throat> polemicists like Tobias Singer. These sources are embarrassing because they confirm the New Testament's understanding of Messiah to be absolutely, thoroughly, Jewish and absolutely thoroughly in perfect agreement with the Old Testament, showing the rabbis are liars and perverts who have perverted what the Bible says about Messiah and also have perverted what rabbis have taught historically about the Messiah. That's why they hide it. That's why that fat slob, that spiritual dog, Tobias Singer, hides these things from his fangirls, his cult followers. Okay. Now, Look what God says to him. Look what God says to him. Ephraim, my true Messiah, you have already accepted this suffering from the six days of creation. Now your suffering, here's what's going to get amazing. Watch. Your suffering shall be like my suffering. Do you caught it? You suffer like me. Just like I suffer because of the sins of Israel, you suffer like I have been suffering. And I swear by the life of my head and by your life, and my light is your light, and all of this in rabbinic Judaism. For ever since the day in which Nebuchadnezzar came up and destroyed my temple and burnt my sanctuary, and I exiled my children among the nations of the world, by your life and the life of our head, I have not sat on my throne. And if you don't believe me, see the dew that is upon my head. Okay, now watch here, the final part of it. Look what he says. Look what Messiah supposedly says. In that hour, he says, before him, so Messiah now says to God, Master of the world, now my mind is at rest, for it is sufficient for the servant to be like his master. So I'm like you. My light is your light. You swear on the life of your head and on my life, right? And your suffering's my suffering, my suffering's your suffering. I'm like you and I'm happy. 
Rivka Ulmer. Look what she's going to say about the Pasikta Rabati. She is not Christian. She is a Jewish scholar. And she's going to explain the implication, the theological implication of the Pasikta Rabati and how it's similar to Christianity. Look what she's going to say. And then I'm going to quote her translation. Please pay attention. Look what she says. This comes from the book. Okay. Let me give you it. And you can actually see a section of it on Google Books. Here's what I'm quoting from. Rifka Omer. Pay attention, brothers, sisters. Please. This is gold. Stop distracting. This is from her article. The Jewish Jesus. The Jewish Jesus. Jesus. Revelation. Reflection. Reclamation. In the book. This is a chapter in this book. The Jewish Jesus, Revelation, Reflection, Reclamation, edited by Zev Garber. Purdue University Press, West Lafayette, Indiana, published 2011, page 120. Okay? These are Jewish scholars who are trying to show you how the New Testament and its portrayal of Jesus is thoroughly Jewish. Because you find Jewish parallels in rabbinic sources. Okay? Are we getting it? So I can move on and quote what she says. What does she say about the Pasikta Rabati? Then I'm going to read her translation. Please, guys, listen. Okay, so let's continue. Look what she says, brethren. Here you're going to get blown away. Look, this is her, not me. Okay, so Rifka Omer, the Messiah's dep depiction in Pasikta Rabati. Does it comport with Christian understanding of Jesus? Quote, this is her. A hidden Jewish Messiah relates to a pre-existent heavenly being. This is a Jewish scholar, folks, admitting that in rabbinic Jewish sources, they have a pre-existent Messiah as a pre-existent heavenly being who's existing in heaven from creation. Maje resplendent, majestic, sitting on the throne of glory. Similarly, the Christian description of Jesus, occasionally referred to as the Word, John 1, 14, claims the Christian Messiah was with God at the beginning of creation. The concept of the hidden Messiah continues, you'll still find this, in mystical Midrashic literature such as Midrash Konin, depicted a concealed Messiah residing in the Garden of Eden. Music to your ears, my brothers and sisters. Rifka Ulmer admits, in rabbinic Jewish sources, written even after the time of Christ, the rabbis affirm a heavenly pre-existent Messiah who's with God on the throne and another source a pre-existent pre Messiah who's now in the garden comporting with John's gospel of Jesus being the pre-existent word who became flesh, who's with God on the throne. She then concludes with the following. Let me break it down. Psalm 22, because the Pesikta Rabati is quoting Psalm 22. So let me quote her. Okay. Exactly, wisdom. You got it. Let me quote her. Okay. Rifka Ulmer, Raphael Patai. Is Psalm 22 cited in Pasikta Rabati, affirming Messiah's pre existence in heaven and that God destined him to fulfill Psalm 22? What do you say? Here you go. Quote A psalm of suffering, Psalm 22, is applied. To the Messiah Ephraim. <clears throat> and Pasikta Rabati and a narrative of salvation created. The explication of biblical Limata as narrative is a hermeneutic approach of some Midrashic texts. This is often the case in homiletic works that create a narrative for the listeners. Pasikta Rabati contains 
the rabbinic crystallization of creating a descriptive narrative of a Jewish Messiah through Psalm 22 and its metaphor of distress. Let me explain what she's saying. In Midrashic literature, the rabbis will often create a narrative, a story to explain a particular Old Testament text. Are you guys understand what she's saying? You guys understand what, she, what she's saying? It is a common feature for rabbis to take an Old Testament text and create a narrative, a story, explaining the meaning of the text. So what the rabbis did, they created a story of God and Messiah to explain how Psalm 22 is prophesying Messiah suffering pain and distress for the sins of Israel. Pasikta Rabati created a story around Psalm 22 in order to illustrate that Psalm 22 is about the Messiah suffering distress and pain for the sins of Israel. Everyone got it? Continuing further. Allusions to the psalm. Look, this is her. Allusions to the psalm are deeply embedded in the Pasikta Rabati narrative. This narrative is part of a hagiography, hagiography, holy writings, slightly resembling other narratives of martyrs and rabbinic texts. Additionally, additionally, the messianic narrative is somewhat similar to what this narrative that the rabbis developed around Psalm 22, where they apply Psalm 22 to the suffering Messiah, is somewhat similar in construction to the Jesus narrative in the Gospels and the extra Testamental writings of the church fathers. I repeat, Jewish scholar Rivka Ulmer admits the Pasikta Rabati's narrative of Psalm 22, where they explain it in reference to a suffering Messiah, is similar in construction to the Jesus narrative in the Gospels and the extra testamental writings of the church fathers. Music to your ears, Christians. She goes on to say, Asikta Rabati applies Psalm 22 to support the concept of Messiah Ephraim's suffering for humanity. In the New Testament, Lamata from this Psalm are applied to the Passion. The Psalm provides biblical language and the dramatic script for the description of suffering for the Jewish and Christian Messiah. Let me repeat that again, what she's saying. This psalm provided both Jews and Christians a theme, a narrative to describe the Jewish Messiah and the Christian Messiah. In Pasikta Rabati, a remarkable interpretation emerges. Look what, this is her words, not mine. The Messiah suffers for the sins of Israel. No, 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 no. You got to be kidding me. And of the world. Wait, 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 wait. What did she say? Wait, 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 wait. What did she say? The Pasikta Rabati, a rabbinic Jewish exposition of Psalm 22. Wait, wait, uh, that's too good. That's too good to be true. In Pasikta Rabati, a remarkable, her words, Remarkable interpretation emerges. The Messiah suffers for the sins of Israel and of the world. God makes an agreement with the Messiah to be afflicted for the sake of the sinners. And then concludes, right? And I'm going to read her end notes. I want to read her end notes. Okay. Look, this is her. She concludes after a period of suffering, followed by his humiliation and the final eschatological battle, 
The Messiah is involved in the final judgment and the resurrection of the righteous. Say what? Not only does he suffer, not only is he humiliated, not only will he engage in battle, but he'll be involved in the final judgment and the resurrection of the righteous. Other rabbinic texts, right? Other rabbinic texts interpret limata in order to combine Psalm 22 and the aqidah, the binding of Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac. The Pasikta Rabati is a rabbinic Jewish writing. And she's telling you the narrative that they created to explain Psalm 22 in reference to Messiah parallels that of the New Testament. Now watch her end notes. Watch some of her end notes. It's all in my article. Here. This is for you, Archangel Media. Messiah Ephraim, who is he? Archangel Media, this is her note. The text has, there is variant readings. The text, one of the copies, Pesach the Rabadi, has Ben David. It says Ben David. Although it continues with Messiah Ephraim. Did you catch it, Archangel Media? One of the texts call Messiah Ephraim, Ben David, son of David. This may indicate the conflation of messianic ideas in Pasikta Rabati, alternatively, it may be due to one of the numerous scribal errors in the Parma manuscript. Here's her endnote 45. Watch here. Endnote 45 to her article. In Revelation 19.15, the messianic figure returns to rule with an iron rod. This term is symbolic of power. Pasikta Rabati applies the term to the power of the government. So she's showing parallels between what Revelation says about Jesus ruling with a rod of iron with what the Pasikta Rabati says and another Jewish writing. In Psalms of Solomon, the Messiah, Messianic figure, is a king in the image of David. Psalm of Solomon, 1721, which is another Jewish writing. He will smash the Gentile oppressors of Jerusalem with an iron rod. Then now watch. Watch this other note. Her end note 53. End note 53 and get ready to be blown away. This is her note to her article in that book. Okay, read with me, guys. Okay. The fifth chamber. This is where Messiah ben David... Elijah and the Messiah Ephraim dwell. Because in certain sources, they distinguish between Messiah ben David and Messiah Ephraim. As I told Archangel Michael, but uh, media. But early on, they were one and the same. Elijah, now watch. This is in rabbinic tradition, brethren. Look what Elijah does for the suffering Messiah. Elijah holds his head and allows it to rest on his chest. He encourages him and says to him, Bear torment and judgment of your Lord while he punishes you for the sin of Israel. Say what? In this source, Pesipta Rabati, Messiah is suffering and being punished for the sins of Israel. And Elijah is comforting him. It's okay. Endure it as the Lord punishes you. And what verse do they quote to support that Messiah it will be punished for the sins of Israel? Here you go. For scripture says he has pierced for our rebellions crushed for our transgressions until the time when the end arrives every Monday, Thursday, Shabbat, and festival day, the ancient patriarchs, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, the entire royal line of the prophets and the pious ones come to greet the Messiah and weep together with him. They start crying with him and for him. They express gratitude to him and say to him, bear the judgment of your Lord, for the end has almost arrived, and the chains which are on your neck will be broken off, and you will go forth in freedom. Look what she says. Similar in 255-9. Here, 
Isaiah 53, 5 is applied to the Jewish Messiah. Ooh. This rabbinic source quotes Isaiah 53, 5 about Messiah being punished for the sins of Israel and Elijah comforting him and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the prophets and the royal kings weeping with him and encouraging him. It's almost over. Endure as your suffering punishment for our sins, and we thank you for accepting it. And this is Rifka Ulmer. Now her translation. Are you ready? From that same article, from that same book, in my article. Are you now ready for her translation? I gave you Raphael Patai. Now I'm going to give you her translation. Pasikta Rabati 36.4. God began to talk about the terms with Ephraim. That's Messiah. <clears throat> Saying to him, in the future, the sins of those who have been hidden with you will bring you under an iron yoke. Okay. They will make, make you like a calf whose eyes grow dim and they will choke your spirit with your yoke. Now notice... It's quoting Psalm 22, and Rifka Ulmer shows you it. Now, by the way, she's using a different versification. If it says Psalm 22, 16, it may mean Psalm 22, 15. Okay? Keep that in mind. And because of their sins, your tongue will stick to the roof of your mouth. Psalm 22, 16. Are you catching it? They're taking Psalm 22, 16, which should be 15 in your translation, and applying it to the Messiah, suffering pain and anguish, for the sins of the people that he atones for. Are you willing to endure this? This is her translation, brethren. Are you willing to endure this? Look what he says. Okay. And I'm going to show you how. Psalm 22 is fulfilled in Jesus in the New Testament. Are you willing to endure this? The Messiah said in God's presence, right? In presence. Will this suffering last for many years? The Holy One said to him, By your life and the life of my head, I have decreed for you a week. It will last for seven years. If your soul is saddened, I will immediately banish them. All right, if you're not going to do it, I'll just wipe them out. Don't worry about it. I'll wipe them up for their sins. The sinful souls hidden with you. Okay, now watch her. Look what he says. Okay. <clears throat> The Messiah said in his presence, Master of the universe, I will take this upon myself with a joyful soul <clears throat> and a glad heart, provided that no one in Israel perish, that not only those who are alive should be saved in my days when I show up, because he's in heaven under the throne when he's saying this, <clears throat> during the week of creation, <clears throat> but that also those who are dead those who died before I showed up, who have died since the days of the first human being up until now, should be saved at the time. So, so I'll accept it if everyone that died in sin will be saved by my sufferings, right, in my days. Now, she has a comment, <clears throat> editorial comment. <clears throat> she says, but also the aborted ones, even those that were aborted, save them. Those who you thought to create, but who are not created, save them. Such are the things I desire, and for this I am ready to take all this upon myself. So she adds another note because there are variant readings in the manuscripts, right? So what is the note? At the same time, the Holy One, blessed be He, will appoint for the Messiah four creatures who will carry the Messiah's throne of glory. Say what? There's a variant reading in one of the manuscripts that says Messiah has a glorious throne carried by four creatures? Now, guys, do you understand the significance of this? Or not? Do you understand the significance of this? The rabbinic sources say the Messiah has a glorious throne carried by four creatures. That's Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Before the throne of God are four living creatures. Hmm. 
Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You caught it? Pasifta Rabati 36, 6. Here it goes. Read with me. Let's read. Okay. During the week of seven-year period, when Ephraim comes, they will bring iron beams and they will put them on his neck. This is Psalm 22. Until the Messiah's body is bent, he will scream and weep. He will scream and weep. And his voice will rise up to the height from the pain. He will say in his presence, Master of the universe, how much can my limbs endure? This is after he comes in the flesh, by the way. Am I not but flesh and blood? Right? It was this moment that David lamented, saying, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Say what? Man, come on. This is too good to be true. According to Pasikta Rabati, when David said these words in Psalm 22, he was actually quoting Messiah. These are the words of Messiah that David wrote, not his. That's what this Jewish source says in Pasikta Rabati. Are you reading this, brethren? Pasikta Rabati 36 6. All right, let's continue. We're going to wrap it up. Okay, here you go. We're going to wrap up the rabbinic section in a minute. In that hour, the Holy One says to them, right, editor, right, him, Ephraim, my righteous Messiah, you have already accepted this suffering since the six days of creation. Now, brethren, if it's not sinking in, you're going to miss it. Here, Pasik the Rabati, Talks about when Messiah comes in the flesh, becomes flesh and blood, and then he suffers, what Psalm 22 says. And when he complains, God reminds him. God reminds him, wait, Ephraim, don't you remember that during the six days of creation, when you were there under my throne, with me on the throne as my light, when I asked you, will you accept the suffering? You said yes. So don't you remember that? So here you have the pre-existence of Messiah and the incarnation of the Messiah. Because obviously when he was there during the six days of creation, he was in flesh. So then that means he came forth as spirit and then became flesh later on. It's right there, brethren. I quoted two English versions of this source. Raphael Patai and Rifka Ulmer. Don't you remember you accepted the suffering during the six days of creation, Genesis 1, you were there with me as my light, by my throne as I created, and you agreed to suffer their sins so I wouldn't wipe them out. And now later on, you've come in the flesh, you become flesh and blood to fulfill it. <clears throat> Are you guys getting it before I move on? Are you getting it before I move on? Are you seeing it? You have already accepted this suffering since the six days of creation. A rabbinic Jewish source affirms the pre-human divine existence of Messiah, because Jehovah's light is his light, and his incarnation, because later he becomes flesh and blood, and that Messiah dies as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. All in this rabbinic source, Messiah's divine pre-human existence, his enfleshment, incarnation, become flesh and blood. His fulfilling Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, 5, taking the sins of the world to save the world from their sins. Rabbinic Jewish sources, brethren. Okay, let's finish it. Now your suffering is like my suffering since the day on which wicked Nebuchadnezzar destroyed my temple and burnt my sanctuary and exiled my children among the nations of the world by your life and by the life of my head. So God even swears by him. God swears by Messiah's life and his own life, the life of his head, showing equality and dignity. I have not sat on my throne. And if you do not believe, see the dew that is upon my head. Dew meaning that he hasn't sat. He's been traveling with his people in exile. My head is filled with dew. <clears throat> 
My locks with the drops of the night. Song of Solomon 5.2. Now watch what Messiah says. In that hour, Messiah will say in his presence, Master of the universe, now my mind is at rest, for it is sufficient for the servant to be like his master. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 24, 25. A servant can be like his master. So Messiah is like God. God's light is Messiah's light. God's suffering is Messiah's suffering. God's throne of glory is Messiah's throne of glory. Okay. This was from Ulmer, pages 116, 118. Now watch. A few more snippets. Look what she says. Look what she says, brethren. Okay. Quote, Rifka Ulmer, the earliest medieval rabbinic text that appears to cite this Pasikta Rabati, okay, is found in Moshe of Narbon, 11th century, also referred to as Moshe Ha. Darshan, the preacher. Now watch. He presents a dialogue, this rabbi, in which the Messiah is asked by God if he accepts his suffering. And now she quotes this, this text by Moshe Hadarshan. She quotes his manuscript. Look. Read, guys. Midrash Barashit Rabati, Genesis 1-3. Your eyes will not see light, but your ears will hear the great reprimand of the nations of the world. Your tongue will cleave to the roof of your mouth, Psalm 22, 16. Your skin will stick to your bones, Psalm 22, 18. So here's this manuscript by Moshe HaDarshon, citing Pasikta Rabati, applying Psalm 22, 15 and 17 to Messiah suffering for our sins and your body will be worn out from distress and moaning Pasikta Rabati 37 2 this teaches that in the future in the month of Nisan the fathers of the world Abraham Isaac and Jacob will rise and test and say to him Ephraim our true Messiah even though we are your fathers because you descended from us you are greater than we are say what a rabbinic Jewish source has the patriarchs admitting Messiah is greater than them, even though he is their son. Because you suffered for the iniquities of our children. You were punished for our sins and the sins of our descendants. And terrible ordeals came upon you, such as did not come upon earlier generations, right? Or later ones. Wait, got more. For the sake of Israel, you experience anguish, derision, and mockery among the nations of the world. Quoting Psalm 22, 7, 8, which in our version would be Psalm 22, 6 to 7. You sat in darkness, Micah 7, 8, and gloominess, and your eyes saw no light, and your skin cleaved to your bones, Psalm 22, 18. In our translation, Psalm 22, 17. Well, wait, it's, there's more. There is more. Hold on. Let me get it. And your body was as dry as a piece of wood, and your eyes did not see light, and your skin shriveled in your bones, quoting Lamentations 4 8 and Psalm 22 18 again. And your body was dried up like wood, and your eyes grew, uh, grew dim from fasting. Your strength is dried up like a pot shirt, Psalm 22 16. In our version, Psalm 22 15. All these afflictions happen on account of the iniquities of our children. So you're punished. You suffered because of the sins of our children. It is your will to benefit your children through, sorry, through that goodness which the Holy One will bestow upon Israel. It may be because of the utmost anguish which you did suffer on their account in prison that your mind is of sleaze with them. So they're wondering, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maybe because you suffered hell for their sins. You're punished for their sins. You may now be angry with our sons. Now look, are you angry with them because they cause you to suffer? He said, now Messiah responds. He says to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said to the fathers, right? He said to them, to the fathers, fathers of the world, 
All that I have done, I have done only for your sake and for the sake of your children and for your honor and the honor of your children that they will benefit from the goodness which the Holy One will bestow upon Israel. They said, Ephraim, a righteous Messiah, may your mind be at rest since you put to rest the mind of your Creator and our minds. Are you understanding this? You understand this? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are worried. Maybe Messiah is angry and displeased because he's now suffering, being tormented, punished for the sins of their descendants. And Messiah reassures them, no, I do this gladly. I do it for you and your descendants, for your honor and their honor. I am all too elated, delighted that I suffer so you can be blessed. And then they respond, you now put our hearts at ease and you put God at ease. Thank you, Messiah. See it? Right? We got a few more. And I'll retitle that. Psalm 22, Rabbinic Jewish Affirmation of Messiah's Preexistence. Pasikta Rabati 37.3. Because I'll end it with this, with the rabbis. Rabbi Simeon bin Pazi said, watch, in, the, in that hour, the Holy One will raise the Messiah up to the heaven of heavens. Say what? Man, if I didn't tell you this was a rabbinic source, you'd think it's a Christian source. Now notice, rabbinic source, Pesach the Rabbati, affirms Psalm 22 is about Messiah. Isaiah 53 is about Messiah. Affirms the pre-human divine existence of the Messiah, that he was there with God, during the six days of creation, under his throne, alongside him with the throne, that God's light is Messiah's light, who then later becomes flesh and blood, incarnation, enfleshment, to be a descendant of Israel, who will then be glorified and exalted on a glorious throne, carried by four creatures, exalted to the heaven of heavens, where God dwells. Here it is. And will shroud him, in something of his splendor. Did you catch it? Not only is he exalted to the heaven of heaven's highest heaven where God reigns, God will shroud him in God's splendor. God will give Messiah his own splendor. You see it right there? Because of the nations of the world, because of the wicked Persians, he, God, said to him, Ephraim, my true Messiah, be the judge of these and do with them as your soul desires for the nations would long have been destroyed by you in an instant had not my mercies been exceedingly mighty on your behalf as it is said is Ephraim my dear son is he a darling child man I this is too much I can't handle this so Messiah is his son Messiah called Ephraim son of David my beloved son Messiah is God's darling child. Messiah will destroy the nations because he's their judge, the judge of the world. Messiah is exalted to the heaven heavens on a glorious throne carried by four creatures. Messiah is clothed in the splendor of God. God's light is Messiah's light. God's suffering is Messiah's suffering because he suffers like God. And he was there during the six days of creation, already preexistent, who then later became in flesh, flesh and blood. Incarnation, divine pre-human existence, exaltation, enthronement, vicarious death, dying for the sins of people, atoning for their sins, judge of the world. All of this in rabbinic Jewish sources. And the beloved Son of God. For whenever I speak of him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my inward parts are trouble for him and mercy I will have mercy upon him, says the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 20. Okay. The final paragraph. Final one. And we're done. Brethren, you owe it to the Lord Jesus because you love him. Learn these arguments. Learn these references. These are two Jewish scholars translating Pasikta Rabati, a rabbinic Jewish source. 
Barry Tovia Swinger and these fake, wicked spiritual dogs from the rabbis and the Muslims and the Unitarians obliterate them spiritually, intellectually, with the sword of spirit, the Bible, for the glory of the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah became flesh, and the Holy Spirit. It's right there. Okay, let's continue. Pasipta Rabati 37 4. Why does the verse mention twice mercy? And mercy, I will have mercy upon him. Jeremiah 31 20. Okay. One mercy refers to the hour when he's in prison, being in prison and being tortured for the sins of the world. Since the nations of the world will gnash their teeth, wink their eyes, nod their heads, open their lips, as is said. Now look what's quoting in reference to Messiah. All those who see me mock me. They move the lip. They shake their head. Are you kidding me? Psalm 22, 8, which in your version is Psalm 22, 7, is quoted about Messiah, the preexistent, defined Messiah, who's with God on the throne, has a glorious throne carried by four creatures, whose light is God's light because God's light is Messiah's light. The one who will be exalted after he becomes flesh and blood, Suffering for the sins of the world, atoning for them, fulfilling Isaiah 53, 5. Exalted to the heaven of heavens, who will judge the world and destroy the nations. You kidding me? No, I'm not. Editor, edit, the editor provides another alternate variant reading of the manuscripts. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me down in the dust of death. Psalm 22, 16, 15, apply to him. They roar at him like a lion. Like lions and fancy devouring him, Psalm 22 14, which in your translate 13 apply to him. As it is said, all our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 46. What? And then let's continue. Hold on. Watch here. There's more, and then we're done. There you go. And the editor, that's Rifka Ulmer, provides an alternate writing in the manuscripts, a predatory and roaring lion, Ezekiel 22, 15. Now watch what else is applied to Messiah from Psalm. I am poured out like water, and all my bo bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Psalm 22, 15, which should be 22, 14, if my memory serves me well. That too is applied to Messiah. And they roar at him like lions and fancy devouring him. Psalm 22, 14. As it is said, all our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and the pit have come upon us. Desolation and destruction. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 46, 47, applied to Messiah. In mercy, will I have mercy upon him? Jeremiah 31, 20, applied to Messiah. Referring to the hour when he, Ephraim, leaves the prison since the nations of the world will despise him. Finally, final part, and we're done. We're done. Here you go. This is it. There is not one kingdom or two or three kingdoms of the world that will come upon him, but 140 kingdoms will encompass him. This is the latter days when the nations come to make war against the Messiah. The Holy One will say to him, Ephraim, Messiah, of my righteousness, do not be afraid of them, because all of them will die from the breath of your mouth. Say what? How will Messiah kill them? By the breath of his mouth, by his word, by his command. As it is said, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Isaiah 11, 4. Wait, 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 wait. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4 is about Messiah slaying, killing the nations by the breath of his mouth meaning the word of his mouth by his command, Isaiah 11, 4, which is quoted by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that when Messiah comes, he will slay the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, by the brightness of his appearance, by his glorious light and the breath of his lips. 2 Thessalonians. Here it goes. Chapter 2, verse 8, and Revelation 19, 11 to 21, where he will slay the armies of the Antichrist with the sword of his mouth. Relation 19.15. Relation 19.21. Here it is, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Okay. This ends part one, Lord willing. Perhaps tomorrow, 
I'll do part two to show you how Psalm 22 is applied to Jesus in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed when the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2 8. There you go, brethren. This was part one. Proof from rabbinic Jewish sources written by rabbis who are not Christians after the time of Christ, affirming the pre-human divine existence of the Messiah, his incarnation, because later he'd become in flesh. He'd be a flesh and blood Jew. Equating him with God. So he's distinct from God, but equal to God in honor and majesty. Because God's light is his light, right? God's suffering is Messiah's suffering. His enthronement on a glorious throne, carried by four creatures. His judging the world and destroying the nations. His dying to make atonement for our sins. Fulfilling Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Called God's son, his beloved son, Jeremiah 31, 20. All of this in rabbinic Jewish sources, these were not Christian sources. And I quoted two different translations by two different Jews, Raphael Patai and Rivka Ulmer.